tu, tui, tibi, te, te. Tu, tui, tibi, te, te. For those of you who don't know, that is the noun you declined in Latin. It was a little device that I would use after my two nieces came to live with me, both teenagers. And even though they were six years apart, there was a certain dimension in their relationship that sometimes would erupt at dinner where they would start arguing with each other. And I was trying to figure out what I should do. And so I would just start, tu, tui, tibi, te, te. And I would repeat that over and over again until they finally looked at me. And I said, ladies, ladies, this is no time to be acting like mud wrestling wenches. <laughs> the truth is, though, it was a camouflage. Because what am I supposed to do? Do you intervene? You know when you have kids. Do you intervene in their difficulties? You step back. Do you let them figure out how to deal with it? You know, it's always a question whether or not to intervene or just to be quiet and let things unfold, whether to be patient and see how they will deal with this themselves. That all gave me a, a greater compassion or sympathy for God. You know, God gets bombarded every moment of every day. There are 8 billion people on the face of the earth. And they pray, most of them. God, give me this. God, help me with that. God, do that. You know, and, and the temptation is always when we pray, we somehow overlook the words, the Lord Jesus taught us in the Our Father, where he said, thy will be done, and oftentimes it comes out, my will be done. <laughs> you know, we tell God what God should be doing. Instead of saying, how, Lord, do you want me to handle this? How, Lord, do you want me to act here? Lord, I trust you. You know, we often tend to tell God. And, and, you know, God doesn't need the camouflage that I use to kind of hide behind making a decision. But the truth is, is that, you know, God is very patient with us because we need that. You know, we think that God is a performer, that all we need to do is tell God what we want, and God should come through. And that's not very realistic. You know, yes, he told us to pray, but he didn't tell us that he would give us everything we wanted. He told us that he would do what is best for us in the long run. And that sometimes is very difficult to accept. That God's ways are not necessarily our ways. John the Baptizer learned that in jail imprisoned, and soon to be put to death. You know, John had come, and, and John, as we mentioned last week, as I mentioned last week, you know, was not one of those who read Dale Carnegie's book on how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> you know, he was rather strident, and he willingly named sins, and he shouted at people to turn away from those. You know, the first words out of John's mouth recorded in the gospel are, turn away from sin and change your lives. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Reform your lives. The kingdom is at hand. He said that over and over again. And people did come. They, they came and they stepped into the water and they were washed of their sin. But then Jesus comes. And it's interesting that the gospel records that the first words out of his mouth I reform your lives, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The same words of John the baptizer. And yet, Jesus heads off in a very different direction. He doesn't tell people, 
Well, stop sinning. Don't do that anymore. Stop it. He invites them to be something more. His whole approach is so very different. So much so that John sits there in prison and says, what's going on? You aren't anything like me. You know, I came and I came shouting and you come and you speak softly and you reach out to the small, the little, the marginalized, the forgotten, the hurting, the wounded. Jesus, are you the one? Did I prepare for you? You're not what I expected. I don't know how John responded. None of us do. We don't get that from the gospel. But it certainly was true that John's question comes because Jesus wasn't what he expected. He didn't act the way he thought he would which is always a problem for those who are believers. You know, what do we expect of God? That's an important question. Because we all turn to him. And more than a few times over the years, I've had discussions with people who say, well, I don't pray anymore. It doesn't matter. Because God doesn't listen. I prayed for this or that, and it didn't happen. And, you know, I gave up on God. And it's sometimes difficult to respond to that without resorting to tu, tui, tibi, te, te. You know, <clears throat> really, when I pray, do I tell God or am I asking God? Do I trust that, that God will do what is best for me in the long run? And that's an important thing because it determines our relationship with God. You know, that, that somehow, unless I am willing to trust that God loves me, unwilling, unless I'm willing to trust that God cares for me, you know, there is no real relationship with God. And... I miss out on all that the Lord offers to us. You know, people tend to think that, you know, we're, we're only happy if we get what we want. And that's not true. You know, the Lord never called us to happiness. But he did call us to experience joy. Today, this third Sunday of Advent is called Gaudete, Latin, for Joyful Sunday. And joy, my brothers and sisters, I have a plaque next to my chair in my office, and I've had it there for the last 47 years. It says simply, joy is not the absence of suffering, but the presence of God. Joy is not the absence of suffering, but the presence of God. It's not that God will do everything that I've asked, that God is a performer who acts on my desires, but rather I put my trust in him, my hope in him, that he will do whatever it is that is best for me in the long run, even if I don't understand at the time. That I put my trust and my hope in him and open my heart to him in a way that brings about the joy that only he can bring. Now, we have lots of expectations of God, but some of them aren't always realistic. We have to ask ourselves, do I trust God? You know, it's okay to ask. There's nothing wrong with that. But in the end, Lord, give me what I need to accept whatever it is that is your will. Help me to open my life in trust to you. In the end, John did that. We know that because he died in God's grace and favor. In the end, Jesus himself put his trust into your hands, Lord. I commend my spirit were his dying words on the cross. You and I are invited to live that same kind of trust, that same kind of hope that characterized the life of those who've gone before us in faith. 
people who've lived a life of trust and hope. You know, sometimes it's good just to fall back into tu, tui, tibi, te, te, until I get my head together enough to say, Lord, I trust you. I put my hope in you. And in you alone, I will find my joy. We celebrate that today as we come to the Lord once more and ask that we find in him all that he has promised. Not all the answers that we look for, but rather all that he has promised. It's found in him alone.